Well, good morning, everybody from the 65th District. Uh, we hope you are uh, well and staying safe. Uh, we want to thank our participants for joining us to have a conversation about safety, public safety in Orange County. Uh, we have an excellent group of panelists and we're really thankful for their time here. Uh, we will first be talking about vector control. Uh, we will move then to uh, fire. Uh, fire safety, and then to our uh, public safety and police work with our Orange County uh, Sheriff and some of our local uh, police uh, department chiefs. So I'm really excited that they have joined us. We have seen questions come in. We will try to make sure those are answered. We'll also use the chat room and uh, we will try to do our best. If you do not get your question answered, please uh, make sure you put it in the chat with your email so we can get back to you. But I'm Assembly Member Sharon Quirk Silva. I'm very proud to represent the 65th District. I will just answer a few questions that aren't on the list. One has been about the Orange County Veterans Cemetery. Any of you who have been following that know that that's been a, a project that I've been working on now for almost six years. It has twisted and turned and moved from site A to B to C to D, and I think back to A, uh, but we are hopeful that sometime in the future there will be an Orange County Veterans Cemetery. The last information is uh, the money that was uh, worked on, uh, not only by myself, but other legislators in Orange County, which is almost 25 million, uh, is in the state budget through CalVet. Uh, we are waiting now to find out uh, what the city of Irvine uh, next steps are. So it's been quite a long process, but we'll continue to be hopeful with that. So I'm now going to open it up to our speaker here from the Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control, Laura Young. Uh, she, all of our uh, panelists will give about a five minute update and then we'll weave in some questions. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to update your constituents on what's going on with vector control and how they can help us in reducing the mosquito population. So I'm gonna go ahead and just share a screen because these visuals actually are very helpful in uh, identifying mosquitoes. So, Hopefully everybody can see um, the mosquitoes. Now we have 27 different mosquitoes in Orange County and Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control is a special district that uh, surveillance and treats and educates for mosquitoes, rats, and red imported fire ants and filth flies. In the summer, we focus a majority of our work on mosquitoes because as most people have realized, mosquitoes flourish and their population increases in the summer. And the most common question we're getting now is, why are there so many mosquitoes now than ever before? And one of the most common comments I get from residents is, I've lived here for 30 some odd years and I've never had this level of mosquitoes. And that's because we have some newer mosquitoes in the county. Our southern house mosquito, which we call our Culex mosquito, that's the one we've had predominantly in the county and urban areas, and that's the one that carries West Nile virus. And then these other two mosquitoes are our 80s mosquitoes, or most people refer to them as ankle biters. These are the ones that are really impacting our residents. They do have the capability of transmitting disease, but currently in Orange County, we don't have these diseases here. Um, such as Zika, dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya, and dog heartworm. So um, these are considered more nuisance mosquitoes at this time. The difference is that the 80s mosquitoes, they prefer to bite people, and they prefer to bite during the daytime, and they bite multiple times. So people that are experiencing uh, multiple bites in their backyards, these are the mosquitoes that are really impacting you. And the other question we get is, well, what is vector control going to do about all these mosquitoes? So our role is as a public health agency to help bring awareness, educate, and empower residents to control for the mosquitoes on their backyard. There's 3.2 million residents in Orange County and we can't get to every household. The good news with these mosquitoes is they prefer to breed in backyards and small sources. So with every resident taking an active measure to eliminate standing water, we can greatly reduce the population. Um, and 
hopefully reduce the biting pressure in those neighborhoods. But you can always give us a call and our inspectors can come out and help you identify any sources if you aren't able to do so on your own property. We do have a very extensive website that has a DIY page with the exhaustive checklist on what the sources are. So a lot of our focus in the summer is mosquito control, but also conducting surveillance on uh, diseases in the county. And the disease that we have endemic, which means we have every year in the county, is West Nile virus. So currently we've had West Nile virus positive mosquitoes found in Anaheim, Buena Park, Cypress, Fullerton, Garden Grove, Huntington Beach, Irvine, Seal Beach, and Westminster. Now you'll see it's sort of congregating in that um, northern but west side of the county. So uh, we continue to monitor. The good news is we're not seeing a lot of West Nile virus case um, mosquitoes positive in the county, but uh, we have West Nile virus activity till typically about September, so we'll continue to monitor. Now, some people may remember from last year that we did conduct some adult mosquito control. And the reason we conduct adult mosquito control is because there is a prevalence of high West Nile virus positive mosquitoes. And in that case, the risk to public health um, is greater than just the mosquitoes. So we have to conduct some control in order to reduce the disease prevalence in those areas. When we do do that, we do notify residents either via poster, door hanger, and on social media, and we notify all our local municipalities that are in the area so they can reach out to the residents as well. When we apply this, um, these products are a public health pesticides, so they're applied at very low rates. They're about one ounce per acre that's applied. And uh, they're applied at night so that they are um, off target for non-target insects such as bees and other insects that um, could be impacted. So we do take every measure to to prevent ever having to do an adult mosquito control, a predominant amount of our work is outreach, education, inspections, and our goal is to reduce sources of standing water so we never have to get to adult mosquito control. But in the event we do, um, those are the products that we use. And we have a list of our products on our website as well. And we make sure we post all the maps for residential adult deciding as well as our large areas like our wetlands and our parks and any common areas as well. So you always see that on our website and you can always also register on our e-alerts, which will notify you if there's any activity going on in your city. Um, so with that, I also wanna mention that we do um, conduct rat control, but our rat program is currently suspended due to high mosquito call counts. And, uh, but we do provide education on rats. And if you do give us a call, we'll try to walk you through what you can do as well as um, walk you through the website and what resources are available for you. Our rat program is an education program only. So when we do come out in the fall and if you'd like us to come out, we can uh, schedule an appointment starting November 1st and then have our inspectors go out with you and walk your property at a social distance with masks and uh, identify what may be attracting rats to your property. Um, so that's all Thank I you. have Thank for you, our Laura. update right now. I do have a few questions. One uh, came in through the chat and that is actually one neighborhood in Fullerton said that they had the West Nile, but instead of a sprain, they did a mechanical. Uh, what does that mean? Um, so what we can do, and like I said, this the adult control, the spraying is um, is our last resort, but we do a lot of source reduction. So we'll go out and when we get West Nile virus positive, they'll go out and they'll uh, survey the area. Our inspectors will go out and check for any standing water. If we can remove that water, typically mechanical um, or physical control means that we're removing sources. Okay. Now, again, just for the average person that doesn't feel like they have a huge issue, but they still have some of the, quote, the ankle biters, what's the, do you have a recommendation for a product uh, that uh, could be bought individually just to put on your own body, a spray or something? Or Yes, absolutely. So we actually recommend everybody 
utilize repellent when they're outdoors, especially during dusk and dawn, when we know these southern house mosquitoes that can transmit West Nile virus are out. But at, at any time, if you're in an 80s infested area, and you can use any EPA registered repellent, the most common ones are DEET, Picuridin, IR3535, and lemon oil 11 eucalyptus. Um, the IR3535 and the oil 11 eucalyptus are typically considered the more of the natural products, but they've all shown very effective in um, repellents. And then on the rats, I was on vector control quite a while ago, but I do uh, remember some of the basics there and, and it would also refer to coyotes and so forth, which is uh, making sure you clear your property of dense brush and uh, vines and things that uh, the rats actually thrive in. Uh, making sure uh, that you have any areas in your home that could be a place where, where not only a rat but any other type of animal can get in the smallest holes they can squeeze into and also clearing, I believe it was fruits and things that may fall off the trees and uh, that of course they're very happy to have when they're on the ground or even in the trees. Do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think you summed it up. Their rats are looking for food, water, and shelter. So if you eliminate those three from your property, then you should see a reduction in rats and your your, around your home and then making sure, like you said, anything the size of a quarter or larger, a rat can get into your property. So making sure you're sealing up any entry points around utilities, roof lines, uh, chimneys, things like that. And we do have from Dorinda, a, a panelist that says plant lemongrass. And I actually have that in my backyard and I can tell you my dogs like it. Uh, so again, uh, what about the centronella candles and that? Does that actually really work? So uh, there was a study from Consumer Report a few years back and they found that citronella candles were not as effective. Uh, it was really the smoke from the candles that was deterring the mosquitoes and not so much the scent. Um, now there are a variety of products out there for um, mosquito control and like lemongrass, although they haven't been tested as to their efficacy on how they repel mosquitoes. I always say if it works for you, then keep doing it until it doesn't work for you. Um. All right. Well, Laura, we really appreciate it. Last thing on coyotes before we move to fire is uh, coy coyotes are looking for the same thing, food and shelter and water. And if you are feeding your pets outdoor, they are happy to join in and they can jump a six foot fence. So uh, I know this personally as uh, in Fullerton, we have quite a lot of coyotes. I know Cypress does other areas and they are happy uh, to join in and have dinner. And that dinner is your pet. It was my cat. So we don't have another cat since then. But uh, my point is you have to, you cannot be uh, leaving your small animals or large animals just to run loose. Thank you, Laura. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks and, for the uh, opportunity. And please contact Vector Control if you have other questions. We're now going to move to fire, and we have uh, two of our uh, Fullerton Fire Department. Chief Adam Loz Lozer is with us, and we also have from the Orange County Fire Authority, we have Division Chief Shane Sherwood, and you want to kind of raise your hand that way they can see who, you, well, your name's on there, so you're good. And then we also have Orange County Fire Authority Division Chief uh, Mike Petro, and we're just going to start with quick comments from all three of you, uh, and we'll go ahead, if you don't mind, and we will start with Fullerton Fire Department Chief Adam Moser. Uh, just things that you are seeing in the community, uh, tips for the public. Uh, to keep uh, our neighborhood safe. Uh, thank you, Assemblywoman uh, Kirk Silva, for having me on. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of things that are going on right now um, as far as public safety is concerned. COVID being probably the one that's that's at the forefront, um, and we are seeing the citizens in all of our neighborhoods um, take advantage of and be proactive as far as wearing masks and maintaining social distancing. And it's important to 
it's important for that as far as um, containing, kind of minimizing the spread amongst the community, but uh, important for your first responders as well as uh, we take the appropriate precautions when we respond to um, any type of uh, medical aid or um, emergency scene where there's a possibility of somebody having signs or symptoms of e or even being uh, tested positive. So we take those precautions on our side, um, starting from our dispatch and working all the way through to our, um, our interaction with, with the patient. So from our perspective, when, when we arrive on scene and we're with any of the, the family or the patients, um, we do ask that they also uh, you know, wear a mask, try to maintain social distancing and uh, minimize the contact between family and our first responders. So I, uh, both, I believe Orange County Fire Authority and uh, most if not all the fire departments in Orange County, when we have somebody who is, uh, has, is symptomatic or is even positive for COVID, we, uh, we minimize our contact by only having one responder um, reach out to that patient and ascertain what their situation or their circumstance is. And based upon that, we will then bring in more members to, to aid in whatever that emergency may be. So we are very appreciative of the public taking those precautions um, to help maintain the workforce for, uh, for the fire side. Um, as far as the, the wildland and the fire season is concerned, we are just starting to, to ramp up. Today is it a good, good example of that um, with the extreme high temperatures we're going to see today. Um, and that is just for all our seniors because everybody is home right now, um, is to make sure that people are staying hydrated. Um, they're taking the proper precautions earlier in the day to plan out for days such as, uh, as today where we're going to be in the high 90s, low 100s, um, to make sure that they are able to be safe and they have a plan in place. Um, so I'll kick it over to, uh, to Chief Petro or Chief Sherwood to take on Let's go one. with uh, Chief Petro. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, Kirk Silva for having us on behalf of uh, Chief Brian Fennessy. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, just to share a little bit more, um, and Chief Lozier is right, I think consistently within the Orange County operational area, fire agencies uh, have uh, from the onset of COVID uh, taken precautions and changed business practices um, from the way we receive calls and the questions that are asked of those that are reporting calls. Uh, all the way through patient care as we uh, escort patients to the hospital. We appreciate the public's patience with us as we ask additional questions. And on occasion, we may even ask them to exit the home and uh, meet the responders outdoors uh, for the safety of the responders and other family members that may be home. Um, the, uh, the practices, uh, of course, um, involve a great deal of, of uh, PPE. Uh, personal protective equipment uh, that uh, we utilize. We may even ask the public to don a mask um, while we're treating them to protect those that are responding. Um, we are taking those precautions to limit the number of responders that have uh, close contact with a patient uh, if they are symptomatic to COVID symptoms. Um, so practices have changed. Uh, hygiene around the station, even business practices within our fire stations has changed. We're currently uh, restricting public access to our firehouses in order to keep our firefighters safe as well. Um, we're uh, emphasizing the hygiene, even social distancing and mask wearing uh, where appropriate even well at the fire station. So of course, uh, things have changed dramatically uh, in our business. Can I ask you, if, if you get a call, an emergency call, are, are uh, the people calling typically say, calling and saying, we think our family member has COVID and then you know that uh, before you get onto the scene or sometimes you arrive and then they're giving you uh, symptoms and then some of you make that determination? Well, we do our very best when a call is received in our emergency, or emergency command center, the call takers are uh, required now to ask specific questions. If it's a medical related emergency, they'll be asking specific questions, specific questions as to the symptoms consistent with COVID-19 in order to give our responders a heads up. And, and while the, the uh, dispatch has already taken place and the crews are en route, uh, additional information is provided to them 
um, either by radio or on our um, dispatch system to uh, alarm them or warn them that this patient may be exhibiting signs and symptoms of COVID and allows them to, of course, take appropriate actions when interacting with those patients. In the event that we get there, that's why one of the reasons why we're limiting the number of people who are making close contact with patients, if they are symptomatic, uh, we wanna make sure that we're not exposing our personnel um, and it gives others that may need, uh, uh, may need to be needed for treatment to don the appropriate PPE before interacting with them. Great question, thank you. One, one thing I just put in there too, all these, all these um, precautions that the fire departments are taking, uh, they're to being taken also on the hospital, the, the, pre, the hospital um, scenes as well. So uh, COVID is one emergency that people are having, but that still doesn't mean people are still having heart attacks, they're having respiratory issues, diabetic issues. We want the public to know that if you have an emergency, please call 911 so we can come out there and safely ascertain what your problem is and get you to the appropriate facility. So people should feel confident that from the time they're being transported or calling to the time they get to the hospital and being treated, that's a, that chain of that chain of um, of response or care uh, is extremely safe. And uh, we don't want people worrying that it's not gonna be safe that they can't call us or go to the hospital for treatment for other things because they're worried they're gonna contract uh, COVID. Um, there's a lot of steps that have been put in place to make sure that other emergencies can be treated safely. Thank you. Can I go to um, the division chief uh, with Shane? And any of you can chime in, but Shane, I'm a former teacher, and during this time, we always hear about uh, a child or family or somebody who is having major issues with water safety and sadly even drownings. Can you speak to that? For sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's nice to see some old friends, and uh, unfortunately, I don't work in your, uh, in your district any longer, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to... Uh, to especially discuss water safety. And uh, uh, I think Chief Picho and Chief Lozer definitely covered uh, COVID-19. Uh, but yes, water safety is uh, very important. As you heard, the, the, the temperatures today from Chief Lozer are gonna be extremely hot. And we expect our communities to be uh, around the waters trying to, uh, to battle that heat. Um, but yeah, well, for us, for Orange County Fire Authority, uh, we, we uh, cover the, what we call the ABCs of water safety. And the A being that is adult supervision or active supervision. And uh, extremely important, um, you know, most people that have unfortunately experienced a, a child that is either drowning or near drowning, uh, they talk about how it happens in a second and there was nothing that was ever heard. And so there's that silence event, silent event that happens uh, that uh, sometimes fortunately leads to a tragic uh, end result. But we, uh, we emphasize the ABCs, A being that adult supervision, that active supervision. The B of that is barriers, having those barriers around uh, our swimming pools in your backyard uh, and making sure that those aren't compromised uh, and there's a way for, uh, you know, uh, whether it's children or adults that, that do not have the ability or the, uh, to be safe in the water uh, to get in there. And then the third thing being the classes, uh, learning uh, CPR uh, is, is, is a high priority and something that we recommend uh, everybody in the community uh, have that ability uh, to not just the event that may be drowning, but as we touched on, you know, someone that has a heart attack. Um, so, so those are the ABCs. Um, we have a lot of information. Uh, th on our thank website. you on that. I want to just note that we're seeing a huge increase in people buying uh, some of those small pools in their backyard. And sometimes the thought is even of a little children's wading pool that you know you can run in and get a coffee. But have you seen cases where there's very little water or a small pool and someone still can drown? Correct, that, and that's a great point. It, it takes very little water for, for someone to, uh, to drown and uh, to be incapacitated. Um, they even talk of even a bucket of water. Uh, a, a small child you know, ended up in, in, inside of the, uh, their head inside, under the water there. So absolutely great point. Those are, those are just as, uh, uh, all the ABCs still apply to, do, to those pools, uh, regardless of how large or small uh, that body of water is. And then Division Chief Mike Petro, can you speak about uh, wildfires in the sense of what individuals can do uh, around their homes or in their neighborhoods at, to eliminate the risk? Uh, absolutely. 
Um, one of the things uh, that, uh, and, and I will direct uh, those that are viewing uh, a lot of information on drowning prevention, even COVID, but especially on this topic about uh, wildland fire prevention and protection uh, around your homes can be found at www.ocfa.org. Uh, a tremendous amount of information is available to the public. Uh, one of the things we emphasize is the three or the four R's of vegetation management around homes, removal, reduction, replacement, and resistive material. Um, whoa, 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 that was fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One more time. R's. Okay. The removal? four R's. Removal, uh, a reduction of the load of fuel or those, those uh, vegetation, ornamental okay. vegetation that we plant around our houses. Uh, replacing uh, vegetation uh, that may be more fire prone or carry fire uh, more actively than others. And replacing it, that's the fourth R, with plants that are less, are more fire resistive. Um, it, it is, uh, and then there are uh, quite a few other things to do. Uh, people don't think about the amount of either needle litter or leaf litter that accumulates in rain gutters, the amount of, of, of debris that just falls naturally, dead leaves and branches that may gather and land on the ground that need to be cleaned up. Especially we talk about the defensible space, the first 30 feet from your home being uh, um, quite aggressively protected and removal of dead fuels a reduction of fuels, reducing the height of those vegetation or those trees, and then the next 70 feet outward, again, getting more and more progressively uh, thinning out and removing those fuels that are dead that have a more ch uh, higher chance of carrying fire, uh, not only to that individual's home, but also their neighbor's homes. Um, we talk about Ready, Set, Go, which is a program that is statewide. OCFA uh, has a, quite a bit of information on the Ready, Set, Go program. The Ready part is uh, one, uh, preparing your home, um, preparing yourself, what is the kit that you might put together in the, in the event that you have to evacuate? Do you know your evacuation routes? Uh, so it is the, the ready part, the preparedness part. And the set part is uh, when there is a fire, uh, staying um, engaged and apprised of the situation, um, maintaining that awareness of what's happening around you, preparing and maybe possibly even packing your car with those things that you may need, your medications, uh, um, important paperwork, et cetera. Um, and the last thing is the go, which is when you're asked to leave, um, to leave promptly. Um, one of the things that we try to avoid is that uh, people wait a long time and um, then they leave. And that quite often causes congestion on the roadways for those that are trying to evacuate, as well as those responders that are trying to go in and save those homes um, and protect them from the fire. So again, ready, set, go. And as I mentioned before, a, uh, a lot of that information is available um, on our website at uh, www. You guys use a lot of acronyms. A, B, C, R, 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 R. I'm now ready, set, go, right? Okay, I like <laughs> we do. that. Um, so, we got to keep it simple. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to get, well, just to end the fire part, I did have the opportunity to go out with the Orange County Fire Authority in one of the helicopters to see over in your Belinda where the fire a few years jumped the freeway and went straight up that embankment and uh, actually some homes were lost. And so one of the things that we and the state, and I'm gonna put quotations around, are trying to work closely with Caltrans to make sure we can keep those fire areas clean. Uh, in the 65th district, I will uh, let people know there have been some issues, major issues right now with uh, um, homeless on some of the embankments and also a lot of trash. We have been working with a team uh, to, to do everything we can. Number one, having a tent on a Caltrans piece of property is very unsafe. Number two, it's not legal. And number three, uh, we are working with the county and the individual cities to come in and make sure the people uh, that are there understand there are op options for them to move to, uh, giving them notice. Uh, but right now, currently uh, on the 91 uh, freeway uh, west of in between Lemon and Harbor in Fullerton, and also, um, in Buena Park, I believe it's the, is it the five freeway? Yes, five the five freeway. freeway. So we are working and they are going through those processes. Uh, so that would, uh, if you do stay on, we will come back to, uh, to speaking about homeless in the sense of public safety. 
but uh, I want to make sure uh, I'm looking at the time here. So I think instead of coming back, I'll ask you right now as far as the fire goes in, and because I know uh, with not only our police departments, but our fire departments, sometimes you're the first on the scene to be called, uh, whether it's an incident uh, with an uh, individual related to homelessness or mental health or encampments and so forth. Can, can any of the three of you from fire speak to that? And then we'll move to public uh, police and sheriff after. I know those are tough questions. Yeah, and I, on situations such as that, they, they definitely take that multi-agency multi response. We work with, um, with our partners in police. Uh, and then we also, whether it's Caltrans or the railroads, um, we work with them to help clear it out. So it may be fires taking the initial step of, of securing and taking care of the scene, making sure people are safe, treating people if necessary, extinguishing the fire, and then working with police to, uh, to help with, if it is a homeless situation, how to mitigate that best. Um, we do have two places, two, uh, two shelters or two, um, uh, centers that are open now in our in our area both in placentia and buena park so we do work with our police um, to help us figure out that situation and then follow up with caltrans or uh, union pacific or bnsf if it is along the railroad tracks to uh to mitigate reduce any um type of flammable brush that's happened to accumulate or trash that's accumulated as well yeah we have found it to be uh a pretty extensive issue and uh, sometimes the individuals who are actually on the Caltrans are telling uh, sometimes they're saying well they can be there because it's state land and it's not the city or the, uh, the city or the county and uh, the, the truth is that they can't be there. And so we are uh, working with a team now to, to work on those specific areas as uh, particularly the uh, Lemon Street through Harbor on the 91 is now growing into about 15 tents. The, 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 the team will be working on that this next week. Um, and again, it isn't that we don't want to see people housed, we don't want them intense on the Caltrans because it's very, very dangerous. So that being said, I know you are many times out there on the front lines of that. So we thank you uh, very much. It, it's not an easy drop job. Uh, we did have a question in the chat about our, whether it's the fire or vector or even the police department, are there any uh, media type of, whether they be commercials or ads about earthquake prevention or vector control, any of these. I know that sometimes uh, the, the public channels will air some of these things, but I'm not, I haven't seen any recently. Uh, regarding uh, earthquakes, I, I do know that uh, in October we usually have, uh, it's our month set aside for earthquake awareness and preparedness. Uh, the state conducts a statewide, uh, the great state shakeout, and they do it through various preparedness exercises. So October is emphasized for preparedness for earthquake safety, and you'll probably see a media campaign during that time. Um, I would say that uh, if uh, individuals are looking for information and material regarding preparedness for earthquakes, um, either through their individual cities, emergency management divisions, or um, individual uh, uh, fire agencies. I know the OCFA, again, on our website, you can find information on earthquake preparedness as well. Okay, uh, and if you can leave any of those websites in the chat box, if you have a chance, we'll make sure people who are on the, the call. Melissa, do we have any idea how many people are on the call? She's on our team, mm -hmm. so she'll get back to the honest. But uh, gentlemen, we thank you. And Laura, we thank you very much. If there's uh, any other people uh, that have any other questions for fire or vector, please uh, send those into the chat and we will get back to you. We're now gonna move to public safety. And with that, uh, we are looking at our sheriff department. 
Uh, and when you speak, can you tell us the areas you cover? Because not everybody knows each area that is covered. Of course, Buena Park knows that they're covered by Buena Park Police and Fullerton knows they're covered by Fullerton. Uh, but I think it's important. We do have with us on this call, we have uh, from Fullerton Police Department Acting Captain Jose Arana. We have, uh, I believe we have Anaheim Police Department Chief Jorge Cisneros. No, I don't see him on my... Okay, what did I do, Joseph? Come over here. Um, I'm here somewhere. And we have uh, Buena Park Police and North Orange County Police Public Safety Task Force Chair Chief Corey Sinez. There's Corey. There. And we have um, the Orange County Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Don Barnes. So uh, we appreciate you here. We know you're uh, doing a lot of, quote, putting out fires all the time, but um, working on those friends lines. Okay, I did something weird. Can they hear me? But, but I'm not moving now. Look, I'm frozen. Can you guys see me? We can. No. But, but no, it's not moving. Okay. We can still hear you. All right. Well, we're just going to go ahead. You don't have to hear me. We're going to move. If we don't mind, I'm going to start with Orange County Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Don Barnes, to make some general opening comments. And uh, here you go, Sheriff Don Barnes. Thank you very much, uh, Selma. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the members of your district and also the elected to serve within your district and my peers in public safety, both in law and fire. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'll just give a quick update of what we've been dealing with from a department perspective and try to keep that brief. Obviously, we've been deeply involved in COVID and our COVID response at the EOC for months. We were working with our partners in the fire authority. Uh, Chief Mike uh, Petro has been one of those we've been working regularly with. Uh, we've been dealing with COVID both not only within the public, but also within our jails. At the height of COVID within our jails, we had uh, 220 inmates who had been impacted or affected by COVID. Uh, we've mitigated that down to uh, 11 of intra-facility transfers. Uh, we have 21 who are new bookings. Those would be people brought in from the community on new charges into the jail and who have tested positive. We have a very robust system how we're, uh, we're working with healthcare agency in two regards, those who uh, are symptomatic with uh, uh, either fever or flu-like symptoms are medically isolated and tested. About 40% of those who are medically isolated for symptomology are positive with COVID-19. The other 60% are just sick with some other uh, illness. And as we've had the outbreak back in March, we started two processes in which we would uh, quarantine those who have a contact with somebody who is knowingly uh, has COVID-19 and all new bookings are also quarantined for 14 days and then tested before they're introduced to the general population. And through those efforts, we've been able to mitigate our COVID count down significantly over time. Uh, our inmates, staff all wear masks uh, and they have all the cleaning material that you would need to, uh, to make sure that the environment they're in is clean. We have increased exchanges of linens and things like that. So. Uh, through that, we've been able to mitigate it down. We may be one of the few mega jails in even state or nationally who brought those numbers down significantly, almost into single digits that we can control. We have had staff also that have been impacted by COVID-19, which is not unique to us and OCFA and the uh, law enforcement agencies have also had that happen. Um, we have right now about 50 of our employees, uh, by the way, I have 4,000 employees in the Sheriff's Department of 50 are currently still positive. Um, fortunately, both within our inmates and our employees, uh, we've had a few that have been taken to the hospital, all have fully recovered. We haven't had any losses of life, which is, of course, is uh, a, a good outcome in that regard. Uh, in order to accommodate the population and, and space, we have, uh, for the first time in a decade, over a decade, released some minor offenders who had already been sentenced uh, out in the community. Basically, we released them early from their sentence in hopes of creating the space necessary to be able to deal with COVID-19. 
And of course, we're dealing with other issues as well. Two predominantly uh, are the protests that came about after the incident in Minneapolis that had national impacts. I know that not only uh, the Sheriff's Department, but also the municipal police chiefs who are on this call have been dealing with that. Uh, as an agency, we participated in over 50 protests uh, to ensure the First Amendment protected rights of those uh, who are there. That is our chief responsibility when we do go to protests. It's not to uh, to go out and enforce the law, but to make sure law is, is adhered to and that people's First Amendment protections are, are allowed. And that's always our, our chief goal. And even prior to COVID-19 and where we are today, we have had um, the uh, a budget issue. And we're dealing with budget crisis now, predominantly because of the um, revenue shortages that we're all impacting because of the uh, change in our economy. And municipal government works off of revenue, revenue from taxes, sales tax, property tax. And I know that we're all gonna be equally impacted. So we're working with our legislature to make sure that we have uh, the ability to gap those, uh, the funding shortages and provide the services that I think the Orange County community has come to expect over time. And I know my peers probably have things they will add to this as well. So I'll stop now and let them uh, add anything or answer any questions you may have of me. Is anybody there? We're here. I don't know where Sharon is. I don't see her on the screen. <laughs> well, in that case, I'm going to take the uh, the artistic license and toss it over to Cora, to Chief Sinus to carry on. So okay. uh, we'll keep this that. Um, you covered uh, the same issues that we're dealing with as well, Don. So I appreciate that. Um, I do want to switch gears just a little bit and, and talk a little bit about um, the narrative that's out there about defunding the police um, and and share with people some things that we are doing uh, when it comes to um, putting some money into social programs. Um, we have a uh, North Orange County Public Safety Task Force that was created back in 2016 with the help of our legislature that provided $20 million to North Orange County to address uh, three focus areas, and that's homelessness, youth violence, and post-incarceration and re-entry of prisoners back into our community. So we were able to use that $20 million, which is over four years, which is $5 million a year. 40% uh, of that money uh, goes to the local police departments, and 60% of that money goes to nonprofit organizations. Uh, nonprofit organizations that most of us don't work with uh, on a regular basis, but provide just great resources to help us to deal with some of the issues we're dealing with uh, from public safety. Uh, there's a total of 13 North Orange County cities that are working together on that task force uh, with uh, over 40 community-based organizations. We are sharing resources and teaming up to form uh, uh, new ideas on how to effectively address those public safety issues that I mentioned. Uh, it puts a little less strain on our resources when we have the funding to be able to do that. It's really no longer about enforcement. I think all of us can agree on that. It's, it's really about addressing the deep root causes of some of these public safety issues and to mitigate them uh, for, uh, for the future. So, you know, we've been involved in a, 13 cities have been involved in a number of joint regional operations uh, that have produced some positive results uh, and that uh, we weren't able to do that without the additional funding. And our partnership with our community-based organizations in addressing these issues from the root causes is not only astounding, but it's a win-win for law enforcement and a win-win for those uh, community members that are impacted. And I'll give you some examples. For example, uh, we uh, provide funding to our boys and girls clubs um, and been able to apply uh, to supply them with that additional funding to increase their membership and expand their programs. Uh, we were concentrating on intervening at an early age so that our youth can have a place to go after school to learn about leadership to interact with uh, strong role models uh, and to uh, include their staff and police officers as well. They can have a place to go to do their homework, to socialize and develop relationships with other boys and girls their age and to be involved in educational programs. All in an effort to keep them off the street, keep them out of gangs, which is one part of uh, helping us deal with youth violence. Uh, we're also partnering with the likes of 
uh, big brothers and big sisters uh, who provide our at-risk youth uh, role models and mentors to ensure that our youth uh, don't go down that wrong path. I had in my department over 40 police officers volunteer to be mentors uh, to uh, the uh, kids involved in Big Brothers and Big Sisters. And we actually uh, created a new program here in, in California called Bigs and Badges that enable our law enforcement personnel to mentor these vulnerable children, which is something that has never happened here on the West Coast. Another partnership uh, the task force has formed is with uh, Sunburst Youth Academy, whose mission is to intervene and reclaim the lives of, of uh, high school dropouts, producing graduates with, uh, with the values, life skills, and self-discipline necessary to su succeed uh, as productive citizens. That's definitely life-changing for them. They're no longer involved in crime. They're graduating from high school and securing jobs. And we're also building a high uh, resilient relationship with these community-based organizations and working side by side with them, which is the way it should be. I will tell you that over the last uh, three years and at the end of the funding of this task force, uh, our task force will provide over $12 million to these social programs. Uh, and I think that's one of the issues that these advocates that are asking us to defund the police and apply towards uh, more funding towards these types of programs, we've been doing that. And uh, I, I think that uh, programs such as the North Orange County Public Safety Task Force uh, will be a model for other uh, counties to, to uh, enact. And as we move forward with uh, some of the issues we're dealing with, and we're very proud. And I know that Sheriff Barnes and the other chiefs that are uh, on this call with me are part of that. And uh, you know, we get together on a monthly basis and talk about strategies and be creative about ways uh, to provide uh, you know, more resources to those individuals that need that in our community. Because it, like I said, it's a win-win. It, it helps us in public safety and it provides them the resources they need so they don't, don't take that wrong path in life. And uh, sorry, oh, I'm muted now. We lost you. We found you. Sorry, you found me, but now I'm muted. We can hear you. Can you can hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for those comments. I heard most of them, but uh, thankfully, I know a lot about the North Orange County um, Task Force, and I do think it is one of the best models out there. Uh, again, as an educator for 30 years myself, uh, I'm just a huge believer in prevention. Mm. And when we get uh, kids at a young age engaged, uh, whether it's through sports or music or Boys and Girls Club or YMCA or YWCA, you know, that's where we see uh, the time that they could be uh, doing other things that uh, we don't want them to be doing uh, spending time with a group that's supporting them. But we also see the opposite. And if kids have a lot of time on their hand and not a lot of support or not a lot of uh, uh, discipline, then they are going to get into trouble. Uh, too often as a teacher, uh, we, we see outcomes from the very time kids are young and uh, we want to turn that cycle around. So I really appreciate you leading that, uh, Chief Sinez, uh, and to uh, the county sheriff. Uh, we know that uh, some of the work that you're doing uh, is very difficult, particularly, co it was difficult before, but now with COVID, it's even harder. Uh, I will just speak to the mental health part of policing that I don't think a lot of people know about. Uh, Sheriff Barnes has taken it under his um, leadership to look within our jails, our county jails, and find ways to make connections for these inmates uh, while they're in, in uh, jail or as an inmate. And that is huge because some of the, the guests on the panel will know that I have personally been very affected uh, by homelessness regarding my brother and by the very, very difficult circumstance those who are experiencing homelessness face when it comes to connecting to services. So that we know if there's an attempt in the county jails to make those connections before they're even re released, 
that is going to have a much more profound effect that they'll continue with those type of services that need. Uh, Sheriff Barnes, could you speak to that for a minute or two? Certainly, thank you very much. I think one of the, uh, this is something that I think oftentimes goes unnoticed uh, when we look at our jail operations. We run one of the largest jails in the nation. Prior to COVID-19, we have between 54 and 5,500 people in our custody. Uh, it is also the largest mental health hospital in Orange County. Uh, about 40% of the inmates entrusted to our care have a daily nexus to mental health treatment. And for that reason, I've stated uh, publicly that if we're gonna be a mental health hospital, we're gonna be a good one. We have changed a lot of our uh, systems that are in place to, uh, to treat people appropriately, get them into mental health stability, and uh, with the goal of, <clears throat> before they get released, tying them to out of custody services so they can maintain that stability with the ultimate goal of them not coming back to the jail. We also have at any given moment between 100 and 120 individuals who are detoxing uh, under medical supervision for either alcohol and or drugs and get them into uh, sobriety with the goal also of getting them out of custody and maintaining sobriety with the intent of then not bringing them back. We have for some time had medicine assisted treatment known as MAT. That is about 550 up to 700 at times individuals who are being treated with MAT at uh, the cost of over $2 million a year, uh, with, again, with the goal of keeping them into sobriety. And then, of course, we have a homeless outreach efforts. I have 25 personnel from my department working with uh, some of the chiefs who are uh, on the call today and other areas of the county with the goal of uh, getting people into housing and not uh, creating minor violations that oftentimes end up coming into the jail. So when I hear the terms of things like uh, defund the police, it's not a defund the police argument. It's fund the social programs that have failed in the state over time and uh, unfortunately leaves it up to law enforcement to be by default, not by design, that first person somebody comes in contact with when they're in crisis. And that's not a good outcome. So uh, we have been advocating for, I'm on the president's commission on criminal justice uh, and uh, I've testified on these issues, social issues and the necessity to appropriately fund and intervene. And in Orange County, we have been doing that. We have a B-Wall campus that's coming up online in the city of Orange, uh, probably within the next year. There's a second campus being planned. I can't elaborate on that at this time. It's not final, but it's that goal of giving people those intervention strategies to get the services they need so that they're not coming in contact with law, enf law enforcement by default. And uh, uh, we have for many years had programs like CAT or work with clinicians who go with us on some of these calls and they can intervene. And then it's, it's a root of problem oriented policing, treat the individual for that root cause of why they're coming in contact with the law enforcement with the goal of them not, us not going back and having to deal with it from a criminal or law enforcement response uh, protocol. And so those are the things that I think everybody, and I know not only for myself, but also FIRE, uh, we've been advocating for these programs to be put in place. Uh, the North County Task Force is the root of that. And uh, so that we can treat people appropriately, get them out of the system, get them stable, in whatever their issues may be, with the goal of not coming in contact with law enforcement. And those things happen, and these people stop coming into the jail. I think for the people, the viewers that we have, I don't determine who comes in the jail. Other processes bring them to me. I have them while they're there, and I don't get determined when they leave. That's through the judicial system, oftentimes the courts. So uh, if we can break that cycle of recidivism with some of these people who could, should be treated in some other environment, um, then we can right-size the jail back down if these people stop coming to me. Uh, so I hope I answered your question, Assemblywoman. Yes, thank you. Uh, I wanted to just make a few comments and then would uh, any of the panels want to chime in if they want to add. Um, one of the things that I've been working at, on as an assembly member for quite a long time has been uh, issues regarding homelessness and housing because we truly believe that uh, we can build shelters or navigation centers uh, or uh, armories where people can stay, but really the next step is some type of permanent housing. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to get housing units that are affordable for many of the people we're talking about. 
And at the state, even though I'm on the housing committee, uh, we many times will uh, get pushback on even uh, bills that we know uh, really could help fill this gap. So for example, there was just a bill uh, to rehab motels and hotels uh, as single units for, uh, again, those experiencing homelessness, and that bill didn't make it out of the Appropriations Committee. So there will be other bills. There's another bill right now to allow churches to use some of their um, excess property to build housing, and the churches uh, very much want to do that. Uh, Again, that bill made it out of committee, but we don't know that it's gonna make it all the way. So as you know, there's always competing um, interests. So for example, uh, you may have neighbors or neighborhoods that really don't want, if you want to say affordable housing, you may have constituents who don't want that. You have uh, labor who wants to have specific type of agreements to build. And we just don't seem to get there in many cases. In many cases, when projects do finally get to um, a local city council, many times they're denied because of some of the elements. So in California, we have an issue of not building. We also have uh, the issue that uh, many years ago, we uh, closed down our mental health hospitals. Um, all of these things have had very good reasons to do. At that time, it felt like we were just warehousing people, but we also know that that has been laid on uh, police departments, fire departments, social services, and we're not funding those departments in the way to get the services they need. And so sometimes we are literally seeing, not sometimes, all too often, people die on our streets. On the average, about 30 deaths a month, I believe, uh, for homelessness. Now with COVID, it's, it, it's added to that. But there is no lack of will. There is no lack of energy being put into this. As was mentioned by the sheriff, there is a new, um, I think, very invigorating, uh, uh, I don't want to call it a building, it's called uh, OC be well, I believe that's right, or be well OC. And that is an attempt to take some of the people who are really suffering, whether it be from mental health or addiction, and get them out of the, the emergency rooms and have them have up to 90 days to not only be evaluated, but to get the health services, the mental health they need, but then at some point move them on to a more uh, supportive permanent supportive uh, housing, but that's where we kind of get stuck, where we don't have the housing. So I really implore people to think about this holistically. It's easy to say defund the police or uh, police officers have done X, Y, and Z. And every uh, institution, whether it's police or education or corporations can look within and find ways uh, I think to do a better job. And I think we all try, but um, as a teacher for 30 years, the news will say, you know, we have um, all these teachers molesting kids. And the truth is, unfortunately, there are some really uh, horrible teachers that should be removed immediately. And I think if we're fair uh, there, when we talk about some of the uh, issues that really become polarizing, like the George Floyd issue, uh, not issue, George Floyd um, tragic event, we realize, yes, there's some uh, uh, behaviors that shouldn't happen in any profession. And yet, I believe police officers and sheriffs, they also don't want somebody uh, in the profession that uh, is not following protocol or, or so forth because uh, most people go into the profession to save lives and they are putting their lives on uh, uh, online every uh, single day. So I want to say thank you to the police officers and to, to um, our firefighters uh, because I know that that job is not an easy job. Uh, but also, myself particularly being on the Fullerton City Council, 
when some of you might remember the Kelly Thomas case, uh, I have a, a very frontline view of when officers do use whether it be excessive force or and that uh, the Fullerton Police Department did take the information from uh, the independent investigator and, and actually implement many of the requirements or changes. And I feel that it's a very different police uh, department than it was even 12, 15 years ago. So the, I guess the big remark is we can all look within uh, to make improvements personally in our departments. Uh, and yet, uh, as a public, we know that the public uh, is sending mixed messages. Some are saying to fund, some are saying reimagine, some are saying reinvent, and some are saying leave, leave things as they are. So right now, I think that's the hardest thing is to get people uh, to sit at a table with very strong differing views and really try to figure out, well, what are you thinking and why do you feel this way? And that's, I think, what people are hungry for. And it doesn't mean when you leave that table, you're going to, uh, I guess, uh, come out feeling like you still have uh, the same views or you change your view, but it humanizes people when you can uh, meet together and you can have a conversation, but we all need to, to work on uh, listening more and uh, understanding exactly what people are going through when they wake up in the morning to put on their uniform and go out into the streets. Uh, it, it's, uh, believe me, I, I say this with all respect, uh, there are some individuals out there who are breaking the law and are dangerous and then there are some people that are just suffering and they're out on the streets. We don't know why, but they all have their own stories. So with that, do we have any last comments that we, uh, any of our panelists would like to make? Um, Chief Jorge? Or anybody else? Well, uh, good morning, Assemblywoman. And, uh, in the district for and thank you for the ability to speak here really quick uh, i know that we have limited time i think uh, my partners who have spoken before have really touched on numerous of the uh, issues that we're currently addressing for our communities obviously uh, the coronavirus that's going around in the world has been impactful um, not only for, for us but throughout the county we've had uh, 21 employees who have come down with coronavirus since june 11th um, obviously, because of that, our fiscal impacts and, and our communities have to reimagine, I'll use that word, uh, as to how to uh, fund the numerous programs that make our, our communities great. Uh, we've had to deal with demonstrations and in the city of Anaheim, we've probably had over 20 demonstrations, but I will say that all of them have been really peaceful, uh, maybe for the exception of one of the very first ones where we got a few individuals within the group. Um, that uh, had other intentions. But overall, uh, those individuals who have come to the city of Anaheim have been extremely peaceful. And uh, we have hopefully uh, guided them through the process as far as uh, being able to demonstrate their rights and so forth. I think reforms um, have been another topic, uh, uh, at least for the city of Anaheim. And I would say for the numerous agencies in Orange County, uh, the reforms that came from A. Can't Wait or the Attorney General, uh, or our president, many of those things are already things that we already do. So really the reforms uh, for maybe for one exception that is kind of a different philosophy, um, all of them really are already attained here in this county from your, from your police departments. Uh, defund um, has been another topic, obviously we've been talking about that. Um, I do not support the monetary uh, removal of funds from police departments at this time. Uh, I only speak for the city of Anaheim. We are a very a lean organization and we um, represent or uh, assist 360,000 residents, 25 million visitors and 20, over 20,000 businesses. So I think uh, the budgetary process that we currently have, we're a very efficient organization. Um, uh, that's no doubt that we are costly, but what I will say is, is that uh, I do believe we have challenging times, but I think there are some opportunities with this concept. And I will be hopefully within 30 days presenting to my council 
a new concept as to certain calls that we respond to. And I think the sheriff alluded to that, uh, unfortunately, uh, those are social programs that do need professionals to respond to. And so we believe, or at least I believe that there are, uh, there is a program out there and we're kind of trying to model it for Anaheim that we can bring forward and find the funding. I think we have found the funding uh, so that we can provide a better service to our community. Again, um, we are only a one uh, finger of a full hand. Um, it, it does take all five fingers to work together and, and we can be much stronger. Um, at the same time with that, I would tell you that uh, all of those things, we still have a, uh, one of our main functions is to make sure that we have a safe environment for all people to live, work, and play. And we've noticed that there's been an increase, especially in violent crime in my, our community and numerous urban areas throughout the country. And so, again, I, I think it's something we said it best. Uh, at least I believe here in the county, we're the true believers of prevention, intervention, and enforcement. Uh, we definitely want uh, the bigger sections to be prevention, intervention intervention. Uh, unfortunately, at times we do have to do an enforcement piece. And so uh, these are the things that I think are, are things that we have to look at all at one time. But again, I think there are opportunities for us in this period of time. I know there's some challenges, don't get me wrong, but I look at, at the glass half full and I think there are some things that we're going to be doing, hopefully that provide better service to our community. Uh, and, and, you know, without uh, without having a safe environment, nothing really succeeds. And so we want to deal with those things. And I think the last thing is obviously homelessness. Uh, again, I think that's part of the concept of defund. I believe that um, I agree with you. Uh, we definitely need to have temporary, from shelters to temporary housing to permanent housing. But we need to get them, uh, we, get, we need to get them into those shelters. That's the beginning road. And while we have, new, we have over 400 beds in the city of Anaheim, our own beds, and I'll tell you right now, I got a lot of vacancies, but I also have a lot of individuals that continue to be on our streets. Uh, and so we need to still continue to work hard to get those individuals to, to understand that we have resources available for them, to be able to get them better and get them on their feet. And at the same time, assist those individuals who are feeling some of the impacts because of individuals who continue to stay in our, in our streets. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we, we have passed the hour of 11. I know there's just a few more uh, things, if you can give us just about three more minutes. Uh, uh, um, Acting Captain Jose, you got cut off a little bit, so yes. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. Would you like to make some comments in our last minutes here? Yes, good morning. Uh, here on behalf of uh, Chief Dunn, I'll keep my part brief. Uh, Everybody's kind of pretty shared kind of what we're uh, standing in the city of Fullerton. But in regards to the COVID response, uh, majority of our radio calls and complaints have been essential businesses being open, the public not wearing masks. Um, we've received uh, significant compliance from individuals from us just contacting them, explaining the order uh, from the county health officer. Um, we've only had two instances where we've had to not, uh, not a citation or arrest where we filed the report where we forward it to our city attorney's office. So uh, I think overall it's a significant compliance from the public when it comes to our COVID concerns and compliance. Uh, we've also experienced five protests within the last month or so. Uh, the biggest crowd being about approximately 2,000 individuals, uh, peaceful for the most part where we facilitated their right to protest, the right to free speech. Only in one of them, uh, we, we had to make two arrests, uh, but again, a significant, uh, we're, uh, we're peaceful in that regard. Uh, in regards to the homeless uh, conversation, um, the Buena Park and City of Placentia Navigation Centers are now up and running. Uh, the City of Fullerton Center should be up and running in mid-August. Uh, our homeless liaison officers have been uh, passing out flyers, spreading the information to our homeless population that effective August 15th, that center will be open as well. Uh, in addition, because of that center in August 15th, we'll also be able to enforce the camping uh, ordinance per the federal mandates as well. So, uh, and we have been receiving uh, significant of calls in regards to when we're gonna be able to enforce the, the camping ordinance. So we're working, our homeless liaison officers are working with our uh, city net uh, partners in regards to spreading the word that the center is gonna be open and that we're gonna be able to enforce. Now that's always subject to change because of the federal mandates but uh, that's kind of the, the update information in regards to that. Thank you. Well, th thank you, uh, Captain Arana. 
I, I do want to close here by first thanking all of our panelists. You are all uh, serving us well, and we appreciate your tireless work uh, to keep our city safe, to keep our neighbors safe, and our friends safe. We know uh, with COVID, your job is even uh, harder, so we thank you so much. Uh, just to answer a few questions that came up, one was related to the camp on Lemon and Harbor. Uh, they have not uh, started cleaning that up yet, but it will be started next week. And there's a lot of trash. Please don't go out there and uh, try to interface yourself. Uh, there will be a team out there. Related to homeless and beds, um, as you heard uh, Chief Cicinero say, there are beds available. We do know that um, some homeless individuals uh, are choosing not to take the beds for many reasons. Uh, and we certainly can't force them to. Uh, we also know the shelters that are up, there are um, some individuals that don't feel comfortable at them, feel there's still many risks. And uh, that that is not as easy as it sounds just because there's a bed, go here. I do know there are, again, mental health issues and um, I'll just leave it at um, my brother himself had opportunities to stay and be taken care of. And sometimes uh, they just uh, feel that it's not where they wanna be. And that's uh, much more difficult to, to adjust to when you know there's a bed that somebody can be in versus a street and that's a difficult conversation. But with that, uh, we do have some other questions. We'll try to get back to the people. Uh, thank you for all of our participants. I think we've had up to, up to 80 people join us. Uh, and on the 65th uh, district, I can say the North Spa, which is the 65th district. Uh, we are doing our share in offering housing and working together as a team the North Orange County Task Force, and I'm really proud to be a representative for this area. So thank you again, and thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Right, oh, stay safe and wear a mask. Stay safe and wear a mask. 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 <laughs> Bye.